And welcome everybody to the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America's webinar regarding new financial stimulus program offered by the federal government. I am Father Panagiotis Papazafiropoulos and I will serve as the moderator for this evening's webinar. Tonight, we are joined by Elaine Allen, the treasurer of the Archdiocese. Elaine will be discussing the Economic Aid to Hard Hit Small Businesses, Nonprofits and Venues Act. This important piece of legislation that was enacted at the end of 2020 provides two updates that are especially important to our parishes, mainly the new Paycheck Protection Program loans, as well as the Employee Retention Credit. Elaine will offer us a presentation with full details and slides. And if you have any questions during the presentation, you can enter them using the question and answer functionality at the bottom of your, of your screen. At the conclusion of Elaine's presentation, I will come back and read the questions out loud for all to hear, and then Elaine will offer us an answer. Tonight, we have scheduled this webinar to last until 9 p.m. In an effort to answer as many questions as possible, please try to keep your questions limited to one per participant and try to keep them as general as possible. Detailed specifics regarding your parish can be answered either through your metropolis or your parish leadership. And we can set up a call with someone from the finance committee to help you through your unique situations. We will do our best to answer all questions tonight. Please note that once you submit your question, it has been received on our end. Like-minded and repetitive questions will be filtered out. Following tonight's webinar, full recording of this will be made available on the GoArch website, and any further questions can be addressed to the Finance Committee, who stand by ready to help anyone who needs assistance. Thank you so much for attending and registering for this very important webinar. And that being said, I now hand it over to our treasurer, Elaine Allen. Good evening, everyone, Reverend Fathers and others that have joined us this evening. I do truly appreciate you taking the time to learn more about the stimulus programs that came out of our government the end of uh, December of 2020. Just give me a moment and I'm going to share uh, the screen with my slides. Okay, hopefully everyone can see the slides. Uh, there is a lot of information that I'll be sharing with you this evening. There's no need though to take any kind of copious notes. Uh, we will share these slides with you at the end of uh, the evening so that you can have them for your reference or to share with others in your parish or community. <clears throat> So um, the name of the act is the Economic Aid to Hard Hit Small Businesses, Nonprofits and Venues Act that are known as the Economic Aid Act. So at the beginning of coronavirus, the first stimulus package was the CARES Act and now we have the Economic Aid Act. And as I think many of our parishes saw, this really was a, a, both of these stimulus packages, certainly the CARES Act one that you all have dealt with, was a real opportunity to provide much needed funding to our parishes. And I think you will find that this Economic Aid Act, um, while it is a little more uh, stringent in terms of the quantitative criteria you need to meet, for many of our parishes, I think this will also be another opportunity to avail yourselves um, and to provide you with assistance as you continue to navigate the challenges of coronavirus. So tonight I want to talk about two aspects of this um, Economic Aid Act. One is the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP. Uh, throughout this seminar, I'm going to call it new PPP. Some people call it PPP2. In either event, it's the same program. And then I'm going at the end to spend some time on this employee retention credit. This is one of those sleepers, I think that's in the, in the new statute. It was also in the CARES Act, but most organizations couldn't avail themselves of this um, ERC because they took advantage of the PPP program. The, the new act, the Economic Aid Act, allows you actually to avail yourselves of both. 
both the PPP program as well as the ERC. So I'm going to take you through some of the details of how that works and what you should be thinking about as you, as you navigate both of them. So let's start with, uh, let's start with the stimulus uh, package that was passed in December. $284.5 billion in, for, in forgivable loans, which sounds like a lot of money, I know, but the expectation is that these funds will flow out fairly quickly. Of that amount, 15 billion are going to community financial institutions to ensure that the money is not only flowing through the big money center banks, but also through smaller community banks and ensuring that it is available to those entities that really need the money. The loan applications for the new PPP program need to be filed by March 31st, uh, and they can either be drawn as a first draw loan, which means under the old, um, if you didn't take a loan under the old PPP program, you can take a first loan draw. Uh, and if you did take your first PPP loan, you can take what's called a second draw loan. Um, the most financial institutions now have their applications up. Um, so you should be speaking to your banks uh, and asking them about uh, the availability of the software for you to be able to participate. I know here at the Archdiocese, um, we were actually able to get in our loan application last week. It was a very simple process, much simpler than the first round of PPP. Uh, and I'll explain why the program is simplified as you go through a second draw if you've already taken that first draw. So in this new program, they've allowed for up to $35 billion for first draw loans. This means that for those entities that did not take money under the CARES Act, either because they didn't think they met the criteria, a lot of, I know some of our parishes were worried about that certification that said you had a need for the funds. Um, so either because you, did, you thought you were unable or didn't qualify under the CARES Act, or maybe you just didn't do it, um, you now have the ability to do so. Again, I think all of our parishes meet these criteria. And then if you did take that PPP loan and you're looking for a second loan, it's available to what we call qualified borrowers. Again, our parish is qualified. May, you may not be eligible, but you are a qualified entity. I'll go through the eligibility criteria in a moment. And the maximum loan is capped at $2 million. So the terms on the loans are similar to uh, or the same as what they were under the CARES Act. Again, that interest rate, if it's not forgiven, is 1%. It's non-compounding. Maturity date is five years, and the forgiveness rules remain the same. I think for most, at least what I've heard anecdotally across the country, is most of our parishes have been able to qualify for forgiveness, um, or if the full amount wasn't forgiven at least, there was a partial forgiveness um, based on, not so much on the expenditure of funds, because I think that's not really difficult for, for all of us to achieve, but it was really around, did you retain your employees? Which could, which could have been challenging if you had employees on W-2s that you needed to let go during coronavirus, such as choir directors, or maybe one or, well, one or two of your psalties. Um, I know some of our parishes also did let some of them, their teachers go during coronavirus, and if they were on a W-2, it may have made some of the forgiveness challenging. So similar to what you, what you are familiar with under the CARES Act, um, payroll costs are basically defined the same way uh, in terms of salary costs. Um, it's the same under the CARES Act, under this new act, the Economic Aid Act. And then there are what we call interim final rules that have been issued by the SBA, which go into more detail. I've tried to capture, it's a lot of detail, so I tried to capture just the salient points for you tonight. Uh, but certainly if you want to read up on it, if you're having trouble sleeping, you can find the, the IFR um, on the SBA website. And that website, in case you're not familiar, is uh, sba.gov. 
So a couple of things that they did add though to payroll is in addition to salary costs, we know that we all were eligible for the fringe benefits. Um, and that, that included the items that are all here in black, but they also did add the items in red. So life, disability, vision, or dental during the period of um, sick, uh, during the period of either sick, uh, paid sick, medical or family leave were added. And of course, um, you're able to claim your health insurance, life, if you've got life insurance, disability, and uh, vision or dental insurance premiums. Also, if you've got a mortgage similar to what you experienced in the past, your mortgage interest qualifies. And then going on to other forms of um, amounts that you can utilize for your PPP loan, rent payments, utility payments, interest payments on other debt other than your mortgage if it was incurred prior to February 15, 2020. And if you're thinking about refinancing, uh, if you got an EIDL loan and you're thinking about refinancing that, that also qualifies. But you need to have gotten that loan between the dates here on the screen. But then they went ahead and they also added some more items. And here I do encourage you to look at the detail list but I'll give you just a few of the, um, the additions. So if you had to go ahead and buy some more software due to the interruption associated with, uh, with uh, COVID-19, for example, if you had to incur additional costs to get Zoom licenses or other forms of online uh, connectivity to our parishioners, um, those costs are now qualified as being eligible for a loan. If you also suffered uh, property damage, and this does need to be specific to COVID-19, you know, if you were one of those areas where there was uh, looting or other property damage, um, that's a qualified cost. This next bullet, supplier costs for essential perishable goods. I think this is really targeted towards the restaurant business. Uh, but if you had, for example, any kinds of foods that you had to abandon because perhaps you were, you were planning to have some sort of events and you had to throw the food away, um, whatever your costs are for perishable goods also qualifies. And the last dash here deals with PPE. If for some reason you had to purchase PPE, whether it was masks or face guards or other forms of PPE, that's also now eligible. So you can see that they expanded the cost that you can include to really be responsive to uh, what they're seeing happen during all of 2020 and, and COVID-19. And again, no more than 40% of what you claim for forgiveness can be used for non-payroll costs. So really substantially, the forgiveness is still tied to payroll costs payroll being salary and fringes, but you can utilize these other items also for, for forgiveness. A um, Couple of things on, first, on the first and second draw loans. Um, you can use payroll costs for either 2019 or 2020 when you're going for your loan. Now, I would say that you know, most people will probably opt for 2019. There's two advantages, but two potential advantages. The first one is you probably your payroll costs were probably higher in 2019. Um, the second advantage is if you use 2019, when you actually get to do your application, you don't have to give them any of the, the backup, any of the documentation, because they already have it. So they will accept your application without any payroll documentation. If you opt to go for 2020, then of course you will have to provide that documentation. Um, and there are differing rules based on the size of the loans, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so for example, you know, at the Archdiocese, we used 2019. We didn't have to provide any additional documentation on any of our costs because it had already been pre-populated and received by the lender um, and reviewed in the process, I guess, of being reviewed by the SBA. And just as a refresher here, I think we all know this, but um, payroll costs are gross wages, but it's always up to $100,000 per employee. 
So in some cases, when you know we look at clergy compensation and we add in seeker reimbursement, or we add in the housing allowance, there were instances of where salaries were over $100,000 and still capped at $100,000. So no different um, than what we, uh, what we dealt with in the past. Um, and again, here are some of the other costs that you can include in payroll. I already mentioned all of the types of insurance contributions. These are the employer piece though, not the part that our employees or our clergy are paying, but what our parishes are paying gets to be included in payroll costs and contributions to the clergy and lay employees pension plan are included. Um, and this last bullet doesn't apply I know in most states because in most states our parishes are exempt from unemployment insurance. But for example, here in New York, um, we do pay into the state unemployment uh, program so those costs would also be eligible on either a first or a second draw. So I actually thought that most of our parishes um, had applied for the first round, but as it turns out, um, many of them didn't. Uh, so if you choose to do so, the calculation is, um, hasn't changed basically. It's calculate what your average payroll is, uh, for a month, and then you get two and a half months worth of payroll um, as your loan plus the additional costs. You can also add in um, any EIDL loan that you anticipate to be refinanced um, because if you think about it, the EIDL loans were carrying two and a half percent, a 2.75 percent, excuse me, um, interest as a not for profit. So you could reduce that to 1%. Um, and of course, if you got that $10,000, or it could be less depending on the number of employees, but if you got that EIDL advance, that does not get included because that was an outright grant to you by, uh, by the government. So it doesn't have to be repaid. So really what we're talking about on a first draw grant alone is your payroll costs, your additional costs that I went through on the, on the screens and the potential if you took an EIDL loan and got it early on to also refinance that. Um, let's look at second draw loans. Um, so here you have to have used the full amount of your first draw um, before uh, the expected date of your second draw is dispersed in order to be eligible. So I know that there are some questions around, well, what happens if I took a first loan, a first draw loan and uh, I didn't utilize it? Well, if you repaid what you did utilize, then you would be eligible to participate in the second draw loan. If you didn't repay it, um, then I think, you know, you follow this bullet and you're not really eligible. So, you know, for those that, um, know that they have not met the criteria because perhaps you had a drop in head count and you, therefore you couldn't get a full forgiveness. You know, it suggests that you make your repayment so that you then have the ability to draw on your second loan. Um, the third bullet here, because I think we all have fewer than 300 employees, so that's a, that's a non-issue. The third bullet here, and I'm gonna actually take you through an example this is where they took that certification as to need and they really revised it so that it's much more quantitative. And what they're basically saying is that you have to be able to demonstrate that you had a decline in your revenue in one quarter of 2020 versus the same quarter in 2019 of 25% or more. And at first blush, you might say, oh, that might be difficult for us to achieve. But if you think about it, if you were running a festival or perhaps you had social events and they tend to be seasonal in nature, it's likely that you probably had that 25% decline. And if you do, or if you did, then you qualify. Uh, and I'll show you um, by running through some numbers what that, what that might look like. 
Um, so what do we, when we say gross receipts, what do we really mean? So here's the definition. Uh, this comes from the rules, but basically it means your gross receipts. So all of your stewardship, you look at, you know, your festival income gross. What did you bring in in total receipts? You do not reduce it by your costs. If you're running a bookstore, for example, your gross receipts from your bookstore, you do not reduce it by the cost of the books that you sell. So they're really looking, and this makes it a lot, a lot easier to achieve. They're really looking at your top line number. Um, and you might say, well, on what basis is that? Uh, I'm sure someone will ask, is that accrual? Is that cash? Uh, you actually have a choice um, because the kind of documentation they're asking for could be off of the bank statements, in which case it's obviously cash, or it can be off of financial statements, which could be cash, could be accrual. Uh, and they'll basically uh, accept either. Other items that go into the definition of gross receipts, I mentioned earlier, contributions, gifts, grants. Um, again, no netting for the cost of raising the funds. So let's say that in you know, 2019, you ran some sort of a dinner uh, or a gala uh, that uh, you couldn't run in 2020. You would include in your gross receipts the total monies you raised no deductions for the cost of the meal or any of the other um, sort of giveaways that you might uh, incentivize individuals to participate in that particular special event. As a fundraiser, again, it's just looking at the gross, the gross numbers. Um, and here, if you're running uh, business activities, uh, they are also, they can also be included. I think this is pretty much not applicable for most of our parishes, but um, to the extent that you have any form of business activity going on, uh, that also gets included in gross receipts and, it, and also investment returns. So it's not just your active income, it's your active income plus your passive income. So if you have an investment portfolio, if you have an endowment fund, that's part of your parish, um, that those, the interest dividend income on, um, on that investment portfolio also, also gets included. So what's excluded? Excluded uh, are the forgiveness of the first draw PPP loan. And as I mentioned earlier, if you got an advance, if you got that three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollar advance, again, depending on how many employees you had, um, you get to keep that uh, and you don't obviously get to ask for that again um, or count that, if you will, in looking at the 25% uh, reduction. So uh, let's spend a few minutes on this 25% reduction. Um, so, you know, there are special rules if the entities weren't in existence for all of 2019, it doesn't apply to our parishes. Um, so it really, for those that are, uh, you know, been in business for the entire year, which would be, I think, most of our parishes, um, it's a quarter to quarter comparison. And, here, and here's an example. So what I did here was I just um, took a sample parish, let's say, and quarter by quarter, I listed their gross receipts for 2020. And I compared them to the gross receipts for 2019. And you can see that for the whole year, the reduction in the receipts was only 14%. So you might say, oops, we don't qualify, but not so fast. Because if you look at each of the quarters, you see in the third quarter, here is a 36% decline. So perhaps in this quarter, this particular parish was running its festival. Uh, and it didn't run the festival in 2020. And so because in the one quarter it had a decline of 36%, it qualifies. So this really does require you to do the comparison quarter by quarter. Again, if you don't keep your financial statements that way, then maybe you use your bank statements um, at, to put all that information on Excel spreadsheet and do these calculations. Or if you're using QuickBooks, 
You should be able to get your quarterly information, but you are going to need to come up with these quarterly comparisons in order to be able to certify that you have a 25% reduction in the quarter. Um, and again, at the Archdiocese, you know, we were able to demonstrate that um, by utilizing our second quarter, um, because uh, in the second quarter of 2019 is when we have a very large influx of revenues associated with Ionian Village uh, that did not run in 2020. And also in 2019, we just so happened to have in that second quarter, the enthronement of his eminence Archbishop of Bilofaros, which brought in receipts that obviously didn't repeat in 2020. So those two events uh, in and of themselves uh, allowed us to demonstrate more than a 25% reduction in revenue for the second quarter. Um, so um, this is the point that I was making earlier. Um, with respect to payroll documentation, because I know that that can be a pretty cumbersome exercise uh, to pull all that information from your payroll journals and to work with your payroll service provider. What they've done is they've really tried to simplify it. And they said, if you use the same lender and you use the same payroll time frame as you did for the first draw, so let's say 2019, then you don't have to provide any additional payroll information. Otherwise, you will have to provide the same payroll information as was required for the first draw, which is basically all of your payroll, you know, your 941s. If you're submitting for other kinds of costs, uh, you'll have to put your utility bills, et cetera, and have them available. They don't, but the key here is for small loans now, you're not gonna have to submit it initially. And I'll, I'll talk about that. I'll talk about that in a moment. So again, they really are trying to make this easier because they want to get the money out quickly. Um, and when you say, well, how quickly? So the rules are now that the SBA, from the time your lender passes your application on to the SBA, they have three business days to review it and to approve it. And your lender has um, has seven business days, has a week, or actually a week, um, to fund the loan. So let's say anywhere from, let's call it 10 business days, maybe even less, from when your application is submitted by your lender, you should be funded. So this really, again, is intended to make this money available quickly. There shouldn't be a long lag time from when you submit your application to when you actually get your funds. Um, so, you know, you might say, well, what do I need to have available? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's basically two ways to do this. One is off your financial statements, quarterly financial statements. Again, they don't need to be audited. Um, you just basically would sign the first page of your financial statement and initial the subsequent pages, and that's your attestation um, as to their accuracy. Um, and it just clearly, you clearly need to be able to show them what your gross receipts are. If it's not clear based on how QuickBooks or your general ledger is set up, then you could add another page and just say, you know, take these lines and add them up. These are our gross receipts for 19 to go through the same exercise for 2020. These are our receipts for 2020. You can do the arithmetic and you can see a 25% reduction. I will tell you that when we submitted at the Archdiocese, we didn't even have to give them this. They just relied on a signed um, certification. They did not ask us for our documentation of our submission. They can ask for it later on. So even though the rules say it should be available, uh, we didn't have to present it. Uh, the second option, here is to take your monthly bank statements and to show your deposits for the relevant quarters. Uh, and again, you need to make it clear and let them and show them. You can highlight whatever you choose to do, uh, what your gross receipts are, uh, so they so you have available the documentation to to justify your certification. 
So when do you have to submit this? So it says here, on, and I, you know, this is again from the rules. So what I'm giving you here are the rules. <laughs> the rules say, if you ask for a loan of more than $150,000, you need to be able to submit this information at the time of the loan application. Again, we, the archdiocese, didn't have to submit it. So, you know, I don't, I'm not sure why not, but the lender said, no, hold on to it. You don't need to give it to us now. If you are asking for a loan of less than $150,000, um, you probably will have to give it to them um, before loan forgiveness or when the SBA requests it. And actually, in a, in a few slides, I'm going to, actually, it's the next slide. Um, they're actually working on making it even easier. So this new forgiveness application, if your loan isn't greater than $150,000, is going to be very simplified. It won't be automatic, but it will be simplified. And it's going to ask you to certify three things. The number of the law of the number of employees that you retain because you got a PPP loan. Again, this is this notion of we don't want to see a reduction in FTEs, you know, full-time equivalents, the amount of the PPP loan you spent on payroll, and the total value of your loan. And then you'll make an attestation similar to what you had to do uh, with the first draw and that you say that you spent your money on eligible expenses, and you just need to retain these records that I talked about to prove compliance. Um, in the case of employment records, four years, other records for three years, and no other documentation. Now they do reserve the right to come and audit, um, but they're not even necessarily asking you uh, to, produce this even at time of forgiveness. Now this has not yet been, these forms haven't been put together by the SBA. And if we think back to last year, SBA kept changing its mind, right? How many times they changed the rules? So it's possible that they could be changing the rules again, but this is what we are to expect. So you can see even on forgiveness, they're making it a lot easier. So. Really, if you meet these criteria, I really urge all of our parishes, if you didn't take the draw during the first round, go for it. If you did take the first draw and, you, and you've utilized those funds, I really urge you and you meet the criteria, really urge you to think about taking that second round. I mean, there are very few situations where the government is giving us these kinds of funds with such few strings attached. Um, and so if they, you know, if we are able to take advantage, um, I would think we could all put this money to very good use. So these are my prepared comments on the PPP program. I know there will probably be some questions around this and I'll answer them as best I can uh, at the conclusion. But I did, you know, at the beginning I said to you, you know, I want to spend a few minutes on this employee retention credit because this is another opportunity for us to bring revenues into our parishes. So, you know, I think that for many of you, if you're working with a payroll service provider, you know, an ADP, a paychecks, maybe even a smaller provider like Prime Pay or others. Uh, they probably should have spoken to you about this employee retention credit, and they should be able to assist you with it. Um, but in the event, and so I do, act, I do suggest you really actively reach out to them. But I'm going to try to give you just a little bit of a flavor for what this is all about. So this credit actually was in the CARES Act. It was in the first round of stimulus that the government put out, but most entities didn't take advantage of it because if you took the PPP loan, you couldn't qualify for this credit. And the PPP loan was worth a lot more money than this credit was worth. So this was not very significantly used by entities. Um, and basically what this credit is, is a credit against the employer portion of social security taxes, against FICA. Okay, so for our, for our clergy, they are paying SICA, they're treated 
as self-employed. I know some parishes have clergy on 1099s, despite the guidance that we provide from the archdiocese, they wouldn't qualify either. But for all other employees, uh, this is a credit against social security taxes. And if the credit is greater than the social security taxes that you pay, you get to keep the full amount. And what is this credit? Okay, it's 50% of qualified wages. Originally, it was for wages between March 12th of 2020 to January 1st of 2021. They've now expanded that. Um, so it actually goes to now July 1 of 2021. And originally, it was a maximum credit of $5,000 per employee. So $10,000 of wages, 50% gets you to $5,000 per employee. But originally, as I said, if you took PPP money, it didn't qualify. So um, they have, and then in terms of who qualified, um, you had to meet one of the following criteria. And I think for all of our parishes, they meet the first one. Um, where you had your operations partially suspended during any calendar quarter of 2020 due to orders from the governmental authorities limiting group meetings, right? So you can see it specifically mentions for religious purposes. So if you're in a state where your governor indicated that there were attendance uh, restrictions, capacity restrictions, you would qualify or you had to have experienced a 50% decline in gross revenues in the calendar quarter. Again, that was pretty severe for a lot of entities to um, meet. So they've changed, they've changed those rules. Uh, and I'll cover that in a second. Um, and then they said that originally, if you took the PPP loan, you were ineligible for the um, employee retention credit. So what do the new rules say under the Economic Aid Act? Um, they now say you can have borrowed PPP money and you, still, you can still claim the, the employee retention credit. But what's the, what's, the, what's the trigger here? The only thing is that you can't double dip. In other words, you can't claim the same wages as qualifying for PPP and also claim those same wages to get the credit. Now we know that you know, PPP only covered two and a half months worth of wages. So you could use wages later in the year um, to cover this credit. Uh, and you can go back to 2020 and get the credit. Uh, what you need is for your payroll service provider to file amended 941. Right, those are your payroll tax filings. So um, this is really an opportunity to get money for 2020. And then they've also extended it to July 1 of 2021. So you can also get a credit for 2021 wages. And if you didn't qualify because you had reduced capacity, they're making it easier for entities as well. So no longer do you have to have a 50% reduction in your gross revenues, it's now down to 20%. And instead of uh, a $5,000 credit, it's now a $7,000 credit because they're saying, take that same $10,000 of wages, but we're gonna give you, gonna give you a 70% credit. So per employee, you could claim potentially $5,000 for 2020 and $7,000 for 2021. Um, so that's another nice sum of money that's available to you. Um, again, you know, I think there are some nuances. Uh, Treasury Department still has to put out some more guidance, but this is something that you know clearly we all should have on our radar screens. Uh, and we all should be uh, focused on. So with that, I'm just gonna take a sip of water and be happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Elaine. We will now proceed to our question and answer portion of the evening. 
All questions can be submitted using the Q&A functionality, the question and answer functionality at the bottom of this screen. I will read the questions out loud for all to hear, and then Elaine will offer us an answer. As a reminder, tonight, we have scheduled this webinar to last until 9 p.m. In an effort to answer as many questions as possible, please try to keep your questions limited to one per participant and try to keep them as general as possible. Detailed specific questions regarding your parish can be answered either through your metropolis or your parish leadership. And we can set up a call with someone from the finance committee to help you through your unique situation. Our first question is, do we know how long a period we will have this time to spend the loan amount on payroll in order to qualify for the forgiveness? With the previous one, it started as a few months and was then extended substantially. Great, so that's a, that's a great question. I didn't mention that in my prepared comments. It's the same period. So anywhere you know, between eight to 24 weeks uh, can be utilized for the forgiveness period. Uh, second part to that question, Lane, is I I'd like to explore, explore further the pros and cons of going after the first go-round of PPP before going for the second round. Right. So you do need to go for your first round before you qualify for your second round. Um, so, you know, we would really encourage you to, um, to do so. Uh, again, I, don't, I, I really don't see that there are many uh, disadvantages in doing so. Um, you know, unless you really feel that you don't need the money for some reason. Our next question comes to us from Mr. James Madias. Does the parish benefit obligation for the clergy benefit plan qualify for consideration in the PPP loan amount? Yeah, absolutely. So what the parish pays into the archdiocese is the um, pension plan for the clergy qualifies as an employer contribution. So, you know, for 2020, uh, that was the $8,400 that was paid per clergyman. Uh, and in 2021, it would be whatever your, um, which, uh, whatever your benefit assessments. Next question comes to us from Costas Kutsothanasis. And the question is, is payroll defined as W-2 wages or as 1099 wages? And that is that, is that 1099 applicable? Right, so you know, we had this question uh, when we had the CARES Act, and there was some ambiguity actually in the original rules, but the SBA clarified that and came back and said, it must be W-2 wages. If someone is on a 1099, they can claim as a self-employed individual, uh, but not the entity. So again, for those parishes that have parishes that have clergy on 1099s, you know, you're, you're losing out not only on the PPP money, but you also cannot get the employee retention credit. Next question comes to us from Marina Thomatos. For operations or property costs, do they need to have been incurred before the loan is received? So for example, if we're in the process of installing security cameras, can something like that be used for the forgiveness later or does the expense have to, be have to have been incurred before the loan was received? Yeah, the expense has to be incurred during the period that you're utilizing as your measurement period. So if you're using, you know, if you're using 2020, it's really, you can, you can go as late as 12 months prior to when you apply for your loan. Um, again, I would just encourage you not to go, not to wait too long, um, because this money, you know, this money runs out on March 31st. Um, so, you know, if you have the potential, if you're putting it in now, I guess you could go as late as, you know, go as late as March 31st to use as your measurement period. But I would personally, I wouldn't cut it that close. Um, so I think you have to weigh the cost benefit of waiting and seeing it, looking at the availability of funds versus being able to capture those costs in your loan. The next question comes to us from Marina Vogel. Does the gross salary also include FICA and car allowance? Right, so FICA, um, so we, we need to be careful here. So if we're talking, I guess we're talking, if we're talking about clergy, um, let, and I'm just going to clarify a little bit. I know sometimes we use FICA and SICA interchangeably, um, but 
our clergy, you know, our paid their salaries, housing allowance. They get a reimbursement for SICA, which is the self-employment tax. Again, some of us think of that as FICA and a car allowance. If all of those components are being shown on the W-2 and being reported on the 941, they qualify. So it's hard for me to answer that question directly because I know different parishes have different practices. Um, but it basically goes based on what you are putting through your 941s and your payrolls. So if all those components are included, um, yes, uh, they would all qualify. All right, next question comes to us from Father Stephen Callos. What is EILD loan? Okay, so, um, Back in the CARES Act, um, the, the SBA had two kinds of loans. Um, one was the uh, PPP and the other was something called an economic impact disaster loan. Uh, and these are loans that were traditionally available. I'm not gonna get too technical, but they were traditionally available for small businesses. They made them available for not-for-profits. Unfortunately, the EIDL loan program, um, I believe, I'm pretty sure, closed on December 31st of, 29, of 2020, so I don't think they're available. Um, but many of our parishes, uh, we did do a, a webinar on this as well, many of our parishes applied for these um, and were able to get a $10,000 advance uh, if, they had, depending, if they had 10 employees and it scaled down based on the number of employees. And then up to $150,000 loan. A lot of our parishes got $150,000 loan. And that loan was 2.75% interest, uh, with a long amortization period. So many people took that. Um, and as I said, I'm, I'm pretty certain that the program has closed, um, but I'm happy to uh, just make sure of that and um, you know, we can respond back when we send out all, uh, additional information. All right, next question comes to us from George Psefteas. Does including an EIDL loan into the PPP application effectively turn it into a forgivable loan? In other words, can the PPP apply to cover the amount of the EIDL and have the EIDL extinguished by the receipt of replacement PPP monies? That's a great question, George, and I think the, I think the answer is yes, um, but the only caveat I would, would, um, would put to that is, if you recall on my slide, it was for a very short period. If you got your EIDL really early, I think that refinancing can go in and could potentially be forgiven, um, but if you've gotten your EIDL, I, I think the date I had on there was April of 2020 or later, uh, then it wouldn't qualify. Um, and again, I think the SBA will be coming out with more rules on that. So it's something to look at um, and potentially see if it, if it could turn into forgivable, uh, forgivable debt. I think they were initially thinking about it as a reduced interest rate play, but you're right. Uh, if it goes, into the, it goes into the loan amount, it's potentially forgivable. And it could be forgivable through you know, these other costs, right? So through, through utilization of those funds for rent, utilities, those operating costs I talked about, security costs. Um, so you'd have to do the calculations uh, to see if it could, if that in fact would work. Okay, next question comes to us from Samantha Salmas. If we haven't applied for the forgiveness loan yet on the first loan, can we apply for the second one? No. You must apply for the first, you have to have had a first draw in order to be able to apply for a second draw. All right. Next question comes to us from George Katinas. What if the festival has the same tax ID number as the non-for-profit non church parish? Has the same ID? Is that, is that what it says, Father? Yeah, yeah same yeah, ID. I mean, well, that's, that's, that's perfect, right? So if the, parish had, if the parish and the festival are under the same ID, mm -hmm. You just add them all together and um, be able to demo. So you need to be able to demonstrate that reduction. Next to us from Paul Contoveros, 
we would be doing the first draw. Do we have to do the original certification or does the 25% reduction in gross in a quarter apply to us as well, even though first draw, even through the first draw? Right, so the 25% the reduction is on the second draw. Um, on the first draw, you're subject to the original rules. All right, next question from George Anagnostu. Do we need to do the first to, to do the quarterly compensation if we are going for the first round draw? No, again, yeah, that's that's really a second draw issue. So on the first draw, you're subject to that certification that you really had in need. Basically, what they did was they took the CARES Act and they just extended it for until it had closed in August of 2020. And now they're saying with this new round of money, we're going to make allow you to avail yourselves of it through March. And the next question comes to us from George Psarelis. The SBA also provides grants for shuttered venues. A festival which has its own tax ID number would qualify if, and then how would it qualify? Yeah, I, I, I well, you know, a, a festival is probably still operating, I'm assuming as a not-for-profit. Um, so I, I would absolutely think that it would qualify. Um, it qualifies as a not-for-profit, it also qualifies as a shuttered venue. Um, so I guess you could do it just solely for, uh, in your example, solely for the festival, um, because there would have been a reduction. But the issue is, does the festival really have payroll costs? Uh, that's the, you know, that's the issue. Um, and what other costs would you have that would qualify for PPP? Next question comes to us from Dimitri Romas. Is there a drop dead date on when we would need to apply for forgiveness of the first PPP loan, say within 10 months of receiving the funds? Um, on the first PPP, uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't recall if there's a, if there's a drop dead date. Um, with respect to when you have to uh, when you have to uh, submit your forgiveness application, I don't remember that. I have to look at that. All right. Next question comes to us from J. Michael Sufredini. I understand the new PPP loan would require the submission of tax returns. As a church, we do not file tax returns. How is that handled? Right. So, in lieu of tax returns, it's those. It's one of the two things that I mentioned. Um, either you can give them because they, they contemplated that in the rules. Either you can give them unaudited quarterly financial statements, or you can put together your um, bank statements um, for the two you know, for, the, for the comparable quarters to demonstrate that you had a 25% reduction. Um, again, if you're going for less than $150,000, you don't have to submit that initially. The rules say uh, upon forgiveness, they may ask you for it. Um, but the rules are very clear that as a not-for-profit, you know, they know, um, and certainly as a church, they know that there are no uh, tax returns that are filed, no other forms of nonprofits file a 990, um, uh, but they don't file quarterlies. Next question comes to us from Stephen Diamant. Our janitor retired in, sep in September. Will they say we did not retain our FTE or full-time employee as we hired an outside contractor and now have three full-time employees, not four? Could you repeat that question, Father? I didn't, I didn't hear the whole question. The question was, our janitor retired in September. Will they say we did not, they meaning, I guess, the government say that we did not retain our full-time employee as we hired outside contractors and now have three full-time employees and not four? Um, you, you know, it's a, if it's not a full year, you have to do an FTE uh, equivalent calculation. Um, and you, it's been, and when you do that calculation, you, you may very well not have um, the equivalency in which case your forgiveness amount will be reduced by whatever that percentage is. So if you don't, you know, again, you've got to be able to demonstrate full-time equivalence um, during the relevant periods that you utilize. Uh, so in that example, it sounds to me like you would have a reduction because you went from a, a, an employee to an outside contractor. 
but that wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't jeopardize the full forgiveness. It would just be a percentage calculation. And the next question, Elaine, comes to us from Father Simon Thomas. It's a very similar question to the previous one. I just want to make sure we're not missing an element. Um, it, he says, in, in the, he knows in the first round it required employees, it required the retention of employees to a certain percentage, 75, he says, I believe. We drew from the first PPP loan and retained all employees. We have since let go one employee, not significant than salary. It would be less than 25% of total salaries. How does that affect our potential second draw? Right. So, you know, this is where you really have to look at what period um, you want to utilize, right? Because if you're use, utilizing 2019 um, and you had more employees in 2019 than you have in 2020, um, even though you, you know, you may, you may end up with a forgiveness that is going to be reduced. If you use 2020 as your base period, and that doesn't have that employee in there and you're comparing and comparing it to 2021, then you, you know, you won't be jeopardized. So that's why it is important uh, for whoever is working with you to run the calculations on the payroll costs as well as the, the FTEs, the employee, the full-time uh, full equivalents on your employees for both periods and see which one works to your advantage. So, you know, I know that there were reductions in 2020 in a lot of our parishes, but if you use 2020 as your base and you haven't had any subsequent reductions in, uh, in 2021, it's likely that you will have less of an issue with forgiveness. You still might have some because that person could have been in the partially in the year of 2020, but it's gonna be a lot less than 19. If your head counts are relatively constant, 19, 20, 21, um, then it's probably best um, to use 19 for purposes of ease. Uh, but again, you got to run the numbers and the calculations to see what's most advantageous and really try to maximize that loan. And again, I think this is where the Metropolis Finance Committees can really assist you in running the numbers. I know a lot of them have, a lot of them have run spreadsheets or just run it through software. Uh, and can do pro forma calculations. Um, we've done the same thing here at the Archdiocese. Uh, so if you really are in a bind, um, you, can, uh, you can email me and I can put you in touch with someone here at my finance group at the Archdiocese. And we can, we can help you run it through an Excel spreadsheet to see what works best for you. Because that name of the game here is to maximize your loan. Okay, next question comes to us from uh, George Vlachakos. Is it correct that there is no new certification that the current economic uncertainty makes the loan request necessary to support operations and no bring down of the prior certification when taking out of PPP2? I only ask for clarification because I see contradictory information online. Thank you. Right, so I mean, there, so, you know, they say that it's this quantitative, um, it's a quantitative calculation is 25% reduction. Now, when you go through your certifications, um, and we did, for example, our certification here at the Archdiocese for the second, the second drawdown, I mean, it was a very broad statement about having the ability, you know, the, the need to, there was a need to use it for these funds, but it was not nearly as um, onerous as was in the, uh, was in the first go round. Now I will also, I just wanna share also anecdotally um, because the archdiocese, to ease uh, some of our minds about this. So because the archdiocese was a large borrower, if you will, under the first go round, because we had uh, a loan of over $2 million, the kind of documentation that we had to provide to the SBA in order to get our loan forgiven, which is still being reviewed by them. They haven't really forgiven any of these loans yet. Um, really required us to do a couple of things. It, it did a revenue comparison and expense comparison so they could see there were revenue drops. 
But then they asked us a bunch of questions around closures. And this is where I think this is easy for our parishes to demonstrate. So they asked us whether we had to mandatorily close or voluntarily close. If we voluntarily close, what were, you know, what were the implications of that? So this notion of the certification and the need really was tied not only to a financial number and showing the decline in the financial numbers, but also that our operations were impacted because we had closures. So when we're signing the certifications, you know, for the application and the second draws, again, I think, I mean, this is me speaking personally, um, but I think the fact that we have closures happening and not, not full closures, but um, limitations on our attendance supports this notion of need that the SBA is looking for in terms of justifying why we're asking for these laws. Next question comes to us from Michael Missions. How do these programs apply to self-employed persons on 1099? Right, so as I mentioned earlier, the self-employed employee, um, self-employed individual, sorry, <laughs> that's an oxymoron, um, can apply individually uh, to, uh, for a loan uh, and needs to demonstrate that they, the individual, were impacted um, as a result of not being able to find work, right? So again, I think for most of our clergy, um, that's going to be a difficult hurdle if they were still being compensated on a 1099 because I don't know that they could show a 25% reduction um, or even on the first round that they would easily be able to qualify on a certification. Again, that's a broad statement, but it could be individual circumstances where you know, potentially that works. Um, more broadly, <coughs> excuse me, um, more broadly, there are clearly lots of examples, right? For those that are in the giga economy or other self-employed individuals that are on 1099s where they were able to demonstrate financial hardship and we're able to get PPP funds. And, I, and there are plenty of examples of that that I'm familiar with. All right, I just wanted to remind everyone as we're going through all these questions and might, we might, might want more details. Number one, it's going to be recorded. And number two, don't forget that we could always get more help after the webinar from your local finance committees if you're in a different metropolis other than us here in New York. Uh, so we look forward to assisting you there. And it'll also be posted on the website. Didn't want to forget that. All right. So next question comes to us from Stephen and Theros, maybe two gentlemen. Uh, what if your festival income is not used for operational expenses, payroll, etc.? Can it still be included in your 25% gross income reduction calculation? Yes. Yeah, so if your festival is part of your parish, uh, I'm going to use that as the general scenario. Um, and you would include that because it's part of your gross revenues. And they're just looking for a revenue reduction. Um, they're not, so you don't have to correlate that revenue reduction to what, how it applies to payroll. Um, so what they're basically saying is you parish sustained a reduction in your revenue, and yet you still kept your employees. And because you did that, we're going to give you the money to subsidize those employee costs, those payroll costs. Or you had a significant reduction in revenue and you perish, uh, retain some of your employees, but not all of them. And if that's the case, you'll get a portion of that loan forgiven. And the remainder of the loan you know, still bears 1% interest. I mean, let's also, we're all focused on, we want it all for free, right? We want it all forgiven. But even a 1% loan <laughs> to sustain operations and to give us some breathing room, I think is not a bad economic deal, right? Five years to repay at 1%. I mean, you know, each, everybody will make their own decisions, but even that isn't, um, that, that's pretty, you know, obviously that's much better than what the open market rates are. Next question comes to us from Beth Tsidis. 
If we did not take the PPP loan the first time around, should we do that first? I believe you answered that one. You have to do it first. Yes. All right, move on to the next question. Peter Manolakos, sorry if I missed this. Do we need to submit number numbers for four quarters or just tw the 25% down quarter? Just the down quarter. All right. That's my understanding again. I mean, that's what the rules say. And again, we didn't have to submit anything. They just asked, do you have a reduction in what? Well, it was as simple as a question on a software, <laughs> on the software application that said, did you have a 25% reduction in any one quarter? We check yes, and go on to the next question. All right, next question comes to us from Gia, Gia Harrigan. Last year, we did not include the priest's housing allowance and car fringe. So by including this, we should be able to get the ERC in full. Is, did we? Uh, right, I am assuming, yes, you, you know, if again, if you are putting the housing allowance and the car on, that it's gotta go on the W-2, it's gotta go on the 941. If you're doing that, then absolutely, um, you should be, uh, be able to get the, well, the ERC, I'm sorry, uh, you mentioned clergy. Uh, I'm, I, I, I didn't focus on that. The ERC, as I said earlier, is only on FICA. It doesn't apply to clergy who are subject to SICA. So you can only, you can't get the ERC on clergy because they are treated for pay purposes of social security as self-employed. So this only applies to lay employees, not to clergy. And I made that point earlier just to need to re-emphasize re that again. Again, this is our understanding. I mean, there could be maybe clarifying rules that come out later on that say something different. But our understanding from even the first round of PPP is this is only against FICA earnings. It's against what goes on the 941s, right? Clergy um, are, not, are not on 941s for purposes of paying the FICA. Um, so therefore they should not be, they should not be eligible for the ERC. Um, there may be some it, it circumstances where parishes are putting them on there and treating the, par, uh, the clergy as subject to FICA, uh, in which case I guess, um, if that's how you've treated it, maybe you can get the credit. Uh, but you know, that, you know, that's not, necessarily the correct treatment, but if that's how you've done it, I guess there's a potential to get the credit. I mean, I think that one would really require a little more looking at your, per, your individual circumstance to be able to give you really solid guidance. All right, next two questions are very similar. One is from George Vitas and the same one from, similar one from Ioannis Pavlakos. Can you file for PPP2 before your bank has invited your forgiveness request? On PPP one, yes, I think you. I Before think you've been you, forgiven, you can because it's just that you've expended the funds. I mean, the SBA realizes they're backlogged um, on PPP two on um, PPP one forgiveness, so you can apply. Same the archdiocese again example. Um, it has not received its forgiveness on PPP one, but we were able to apply for PPP two. All right, next question comes to us from Spiros Dimitratos. Uh, he thanks us for, thanks you, Elaine, and the GOA for helping us through these difficult times. Uh, two questions. One first question is, do we need to get the forgiveness before we go? We answered that one. And can we receive the slides which will be sent? So those are both yes. Yes, yes. We will send the slides. Um, and um, again, we'll, I, I didn't put it on the slides, but we'll also, we will also furnish you uh, with some you know, email addresses of uh, you know, either go, go to your metropolis first, but if you need assistance, we'll put my email address on there and I'll try my best to respond. All right, next question comes to us from Michael Pasodelis for the calendar quarter where revenue decline included the festival. Can we use the festival bank account statements only? Do we need to assemble all of the many other bank account statements for that quarter? You need to demonstrate total reduction. So you would have to have all your bank statements. 
And again, I'm assuming it's all, you know, you've got many bank statements, right? You could have your operating account, your festival account, you might have some restricted accounts. You need to assemble them all and be able to demonstrate a reduction. Again, what I would suggest you do, assuming you are a small lender, a small borrower, excuse me, and you would be getting less than $150,000, is that you just do an Excel spreadsheet, put all that information together, so you know you had a 25% reduction, and then you have plenty of time later on to actually assemble it all and have it available if they ever ask for it. If you're going for a loan over $150,000, I still would suggest the same exercise. Um, and they may ask you, they just may ask you for the support at the time that you apply. I think, again, that's gonna depend on your, your bank uh, and what they will require. And as we experienced, I just, you know, I'm talking broadly here because as we experienced even during the CARES Act and PPP1, if you will, every bank <laughs> had a different way of handling. Um, so you are going to experience differences. You know, Chase was different than City, was different than a small local bank. Um, so you may, they may all have different requirements. I think the key really is speak to them now, get the applications because this money will go fast. Um, and then worry about getting the documentation later on as long as you have a pretty good idea that you can meet the decline in revenue. All right, next question comes to us from George Epstathiel. Where do we apply for the ERC money? Right, so that, that, will, be through your, um, that will be through your 941. So you will have to do amended 941s um, to request those credits because you'll be asking for a credit, an ERC credit against that 941. So that's really where you'll be. That's how you will apply for that. So you're, you need to work with your payroll providers, your service providers, to do amended 941s. All right. Next two questions are the same. Uh, one from George Vitas and the next one from Father Costin Papescu. Does equipment expense for live streaming religious services qualify? Yeah, so it says, you know, it says cloud computing services. Um, and, you know, I don't think it was specific as to equipment. Um, but, you know, I, I would think so. I mean, my, my, my reaction is yes. If you had to purchase equipment in order to be able to provide those services so that you can conduct your trader business, as they say it using those terms in the commercial term, I know we're not in a trader business, um, that uh, I would certainly put them in there. Okay, next question. Can we use 2019 data to qualify, but still use the 2021 income for ERC in order to get the 70% benefit? Yes. All right. Because the two are separate. Now, you know, let me just expand a little bit. The two are separate. 2019 is for PPP. ERC, you can get that for 2020 and 2021. So um, the two are not connected. Elaine, I apologize. I'm not sure if the next one's a repeat, but I'll, I'll ask it. Uh, we received an EIDL late in 2020. The EIDL agreement says compensation from other government sources is not permitted. Would we be permitted to apply for the new PPP loan also? You are allowed to apply for the new PPP loan. Okay, next question comes to us from Naum Khadziz. If the payroll is transitioned from 1099 to W2 from 2020 to 2021, will the parish still qualify for the PPP loan in 2021 or did the W2 payroll have to be in place during 2020? Yeah, the, the W2 payroll has to be in place for the 12 months preceding when you apply for the loan. So if you just converted to a W-2, I mean, you're talking about very little in payroll that would be potentially available, right? Now, if you had other, if there were, if there were other lay employees, that would qualify. So if you were, you know, in all of 2020, let's say in all of 2020, you were 1099, you're gonna get, you know, what, you might just get one or two months of 2021 as a W-2 employee, I, mean, I guess that's worth something, but it would be, 
it would be very little because it's it's really average. It's average payroll over the past 12 months. So you would be even averaging that over 12 months. So it may not be worth your while if, if the clergyman is your only quote unquote employee. All right, next question comes to, comes to us from Ilona Rucci. When you receive the PPP loan for the first and the second loan, if they are not forgiven yet, do you report them as a liability or as an income? Right, so that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, so there are, uh, let's just deal with the first PPP loan, right? So there are differing uh, approaches to this in, Neither one is right or wrong. There are just two options. So most, and, and this applies just solely to not-for-profit entities, right? So we're not talking about businesses, for-profit companies. The rules are different. Um, but as it relates to a church, let's say a parish, um, many organizations, you have the option of, of just treating it as a liability until such time as it's forgiven. And then when it's forgiven, you recognize it as income, right? So that's probably, that's the most conservative and the easiest to apply. However, there's also another option that organizations utilize, and that is, and it's available to not-for-profits. And that is, if you have spent the money on appropriate expenses, like your payroll, and you believe it will be forgiven and, and you've met the You've also maintained your FTEs. You can recognize that income as you expend it on the qualifying purposes, which means you're taking it into income. And for, as I've said, not-for-profits during 2020 have done it either way. Some say, look, we, we know we spent the money. We believe we met the obligations in terms of maintaining our employee base. So we're going to book it as income, even though we don't have the formal forgiveness. And that's okay, it's based on your assessment that you'll be able to meet those conditions. Others have said, I'm not booking anything as income till I know it's certain and I have the okay from the SBA or from my lender, so I'm gonna carry it as a liability. So you have to make that assessment and then, and, and then choose. And as I said, seen organizations do it either way during 2020. All right, next question comes to us from uh, Fran Vakirtsis. If we haven't already done the first draw, we can do it now by 3-31-21, and then the second draw would be 10 months later. And do we still qualify for the ERC or the Economic Aid Act? Okay, so you gotta do your first draw now. It's unlikely that you will get your second draw um, because you have to have, done your first draw, demonstrated you've spent it before you can do your second draw. Um, unless they extend this, right? I, I still think, you know, if they have additional money, if the money doesn't all go out, they may extend it. That's what they did with the CARES Act. So there's the potential for you to get, to get the second draw. I think it's unlikely if the date stays as March 31st. If you just think about that, the qualification to get the second draw is you've expended the funds in the first draw. Um, the ERC is separate. So you can go and apply for the ERC if you never even go for a PPP loan. Um, or if you go for the first PPP loan, you can still go for the ERC. It's a separate credit. It's no longer needing to be tied to PPP. It's just available. If you retain your employees, you get a credit. Um, so, you know, that's why I think everybody should be looking at the ERC. The only catch, as I said, is if you do go for your loans, you can't use those same payroll dollars for ERC. You gotta use other payroll dollars. So you can't use the two and a half months that you use for PPP purposes. You know, you gotta be thinking about, you know, the other nine and a half months uh, that are available to you, let's say, and see if you can maximize or get some portion of the credit for, um, for those non and All right, next uh, question comes to us from Stefania Calogrias. If you had a priest that filed as a 1099 in 2019 and 2020, but switched to a W-9, 
would we be able to request a higher loan amount, which now takes in a higher salary in 2021? Yeah, I, I think I've answered that question. It's, it's a, you, the answer is potentially yes. <laughs> it's unlikely though that you would get much, um, just the way the calculation works. Um, but you could certainly go through those. You know, I would, would just encourage you though, you know, what you would be using is a, not the calendar year because that wouldn't help you any. You'd have to be using, you know, February 28th, let's say, as your cutoff and do the 12 months from March 1st of 2020 through February 28th of 2021 and see if you get any benefit that way and still be able to get your filing in prior to March 31st. Because you have the ability to use the 12, any 12 months you want preceding when you, when you submit your loan application. So it doesn't have to be the calendar year. I mean, most people do calendar because if you wanna produce your 941s as the basis to support your, have your support for forgiveness, it's just much easier to do it on a calendar basis. Um, but there's always circumstances where you might wanna use an off quarter period, just so you could see if you could maximize your loan. All right, next question. For the first draw, does it matter how much money the parish had in its savings or is it strictly based on closures and revenue decline? Yeah, you, you know, on the first one, you still, you know, you're still finding that certification that there was deemed, right? Um, and so that there's a number of parishes that felt that they just, you know, in good conscience, couldn't say that there was a need and they didn't take that loan. Um, you know, I think that that, that still is uh, a consideration. So, you know, you've got to make that determination with your parish council as to whether or not you're comfortable signing the certification. Um, you know, I think at the time, we just, you know, at the time when we first did these loans, we just didn't know whether or not there was going to be a precipitous decline in stewardship, right? Or what would happen with our revenues. So we believed in that it was appropriate and what the closures would mean or what the reduced attendance would mean. Um, you know, now you probably have more information. Uh, again, though, you can see that the, that the government is funding even during a second round based on reductions in revenues. So if you, you know, if you look and you see you had reductions in revenues, I mean, I would see there, you'd be able to sign that certification. Maybe it wasn't even up to 25%, maybe it was a little bit less, but it was still a substantial decline in revenue. And if you're telling me you have money in the bank and you didn't have a decline in revenue, then that's a different story. You know, notice in the second, in the second round, they don't ask any questions about how much money you have in the bank. <laughs> They're not asking that. They're just asking, did, you know, did your business suffer? Did your not-for-profit suffer on the revenue side? And yet, did you also, despite that, did you retain your employees? Which means, if you think about it, that many organizations had to spend the money in the bank to continue to pay an employee, right? And they're trying, the government's now trying to help you to replenish those funds, right? So I wouldn't, focus as much as how much money is in the bank, I would focus on what happened during this COVID period to our revenues, since that's what they're really asking about. All right, next question comes to us from Father Nicholas Kazarian. When we say we cannot double dip ERC and PPP, is that for the forgiveness stage or application stage? So that's, was for, that's for the application stage. Okay. So could, then the end of the question is, so could we apply for the PPP loan based on our payroll, but then ask for forgiveness based on other expenses and still receive the ERC? Oh, I see, I see, I see this question. Good question, Father Nick. Um, yes, you could, you could. As long as if you, if you are not using that PPP money to pay for the payroll, so I guess it does go to forgiveness, then you could, you could use that payroll for ERC. Right, so it goes to, you know, what was that PPP money utilized for? And if it wasn't utilized for the payroll, it could be utilized for ERC. But remember, 
60% of your PPP money still needs to be spent on payroll and payroll related costs. So 40% of your PPP could be used for other costs and then you could use that for ERC. Or you can just use a different period, right? Because again, we're not, even those organizations that were using 24 months to calculate forgiveness, you still have all those other months of the year um, that you can use for the ERC calculation. So I think there's enough flexibility um, to be able to claim both. Next question comes to us from Joanne Schultz. We have a part-time employee who has voluntarily requested a reduction in payroll. She is currently just volunteering her time and hasn't been paid such, since March, 2020. How does that affect us for this, the loan PPP number two? Again, if she's just volunteering and not being paid and she's not on a, down on a W-2, that, that particular individual, you won't be able to get any PPP money for her. Next question comes to us from David Chapman. We're in the midst of a capital campaign raising funds for a new building that won't be built for a year or more. So those funds are being held in holding accounts escrow, if you will. Uh, can I include these donations as gross revenues for calculating the 25% reduction? Yeah, um, you know, it, it's the rules aren't clear as to uh, can you exclude restricted funds? Because um, that's what you're really talking about. You know, if those endowment funds, those contributions, the capital campaign contributions are going into the parish, um, you probably should be including them uh, for purposes of doing the calculation. Um, now, there may be some circumstance, you know, it, it, again, the rules are not that definitive. Uh, I think inclusion is the right answer. Um, there may be some circumstances where the lender may just allow you to utilize operating, operating accounts. I think that's really a discussion with your lender. And there was another question similar to this, uh, not only iconography and restricted accounts, but mortgage reduction donations and memorial donations. Is that probably operating? Yeah, I think that's similar in that, yeah, you probably should be including them, but you know, I just think each lender will be looking for different forms of documentation and some are less sophisticated than others. Uh, when it comes to not-for-profit organizations, I'll just say that. Um, it was our experience during PPP1 so in some instances, they may just say, well, those are, you know, out, those are really not available to pay for payroll. So maybe they'll just take the decline in your operating accounts. All right, next question comes to us from Van Christakos. Uh, I need clarification in regards to ERC. We received a substantial initial PPP loan and were able to cover it by using payroll alone using the 24 week option. Can we go back and apply for ERC money now? We have managed to keep the majority of our employees on payroll. Yes, so you can, you can apply. Um, you have to do your calculations and then just subtract out the payroll that was utilized for PPP to see what's left. And then do you, you do, and then you, know, you can qualify for that 50% credit against the remaining payroll. All right, next question comes to us from John Stamatiades. If the ERC credit exceeds the actual FICA tax paid, how does the church get the excess amount? Yeah, I, I believe that will just come back, that'll just come back to you from US Treasury. Because you, you are able to retain the full credit. So if your FICA account is positive, I think you will, I, I, I think you're going to get a check from U.S. Treasury. And this, or it might just go against a credit for future, or you could, I guess, I also apply it as a credit for the future, for your future payroll taxes. Uh, the next question is, is similar. Are, are you saying that we should or, sh or should or shouldn't be making the FICA and SICA deposits on behalf of, the, of our clergy, which you're saying you should and we'll get it back? You should make them. You should make them. Um, and then you'll get a credit. You know, or if you're applying for 2021, um, you should be able to get that credit through your 941 calculations. You just have to be able to demonstrate um, that you're eligible for the credit. So again, that's a con each, each payroll provider, what I'm finding is, is, a, 
Each one is at a different place and how this would work. So the best advice I can give you is talk to your payroll service provider um, to assist you in what is the best way to do this and get that credit. Okay, just as a reminder, we're coming to the end of our questions. So if you do have any final questions, please type them in now because there are, there's one or two left. Um, so this way it gives you enough time to get it in. Uh, next question question comes to us uh, and is, can a prepayment of the full year pension amount be used to meet the amount paid from PPP funds requirements? You went in and out, Father, I'm sorry. Your oh, I apologize, connection. can you hear me now? Yeah. Right. Uh, can a prepayment of the full year pension amount be used to meet the amount paid from PPP fund requirements? The yeah, answer is now they said the, the uh, implementing rule said that prepayments you know, do, do not count, it really needs to be when the services are rendered. Now I know again, in some cases, people do put prepayments in and, and their banking institutions allow it. So I'm giving you what the rules say. And we have some banks have been a little more flexible than what the rules say. Okay, uh, next two questions are probably, they're, they are repeats. Um, just, just to be courteous, uh, Kiriakos Kostadinidis asked, um, if I'm understanding this correctly, if we are going first for first PPP, the requirements for certification in, is a reduction in gross receipts from 2019 to 2020 of 25%. Yeah, that's, that reduction is on the second, on the second round. Um, so you, you're subject to the, the original requirements on your first draws, which was the certification. You, not, you do not need to demonstrate the 25%. Okay. Um, Getting in some more questions here. All right. Uh, next question comes to us from Gia Harrigan. Will we be scrutinized if we apply for significantly more in PPP2 than PPP2 than PPP1 because we can now include utilities, pensions, etc., realizing that that we can only be forty percent of monthly costs? Uh, no, no, you won't. Well, um, you know, you, you can also, I, you know, I can all, you're also able, let me just say, you're also able to go back to PPP1. And if you didn't claim the full amount that you were entitled to, um, because you could have included utilities in PPP1, you could have included pension in PPP1, you're able to go back and claim that as well. All right. I think uh, that's it, Elaine. I don't see any other questions uh, that are coming in. So with, uh, with that, I'd like to thank you, Elaine, for joining us tonight and helping us understand these very important programs. As I said at the beginning of the evening, a full recording of this will be made available on the GoArch website, and any further questions can be addressed to the finance committees who stand by ready to help anyone who needs assistance. Thank you all for attending as we wish you a very good evening. God bless you all.